Hello guys and welcome back to the CCNA video series brought to you by ABY Design and Tech. In this video, we're going to have a look at routing protocols. So, the learning objectives for this video are as follows. To understand what a routing protocol is, and to understand how routing protocols make our life as network engineers so much easier. So before we have a look at dynamic routing protocols, we need to understand why we need them, and the easiest way to see this is to contrast dynamic routing protocols with static routing. So uh, over the previous two videos, we covered static routing and then we also covered how to configure it. And so one of the main issues with static routing is that it requires us to go to every single device and configure that device and essentially tell it that these are the networks that you can reach, which are not directly connected. So any network that a router is not connected to, we have to train that router on how to reach those networks. Now, in an example like this, in a um, network like this, it's not going to cause too many issues. The reason being is because we've only got three routers and we've only got a couple of subnets which each router can't reach by default. However, even just to get this network up and running, we will still need to enter around two to three commands on every single router. Now, that isn't too bad. However, let's just say that we have 100 routers or and 600 networks. Yeah, then you can see how that's gonna kinda get out of hand very, very quickly. The larger our network, the more commands we have to enter and then the more out of control trying to configure routing with static routing gets. Because essentially, you will be spending all of your time configuring these static routes when you could be doing other things. The second issue is that with static routes, they don't react dynamically to changes in the network topology. So as an example, imagine I introduced this alternative connection between um, R1 and R2. So this is a alternative connection, it goes through R4. And at the moment, the static route I've got configured on, on R1, so that Rick can send his all important email to Morty, that static uh, route tells R1 to forward the traffic over this link towards R2, because obviously we're only going through one hop, so that's gonna be our quickest route. Let's say that this link, for whatever reason, goes down. Well, guess what? R1 still has a static route because it's static, it doesn't change. Even though this link has gone down, R1 will still be saying, okay, I'm gonna follow that static route. I'm gonna try to forward this traffic over this link, and guess what? That traffic is just gonna be dropped because that interface is down. We would have to, as network engineers, come in and manually change the static route on R1 and tell it, okay, look, buddy, if you wanna forward traffic to Morty, you now have to go over this link over here because your primary link is down. And we would, and we would have to do the exact same thing on R2. We would have to tell R2 that if you wanna reach Rick over here, then you have to forward the traffic towards R4. So as you can see, it's a administrative nightmare to configure routing with static routing, especially when we have many, many networks and many, many routers in our enterprise. Secondly, they don't react dynamically to, to changes in our topology. Now you may be thinking, well, wait a minute after, well, static routes in this sort of environment are fine. So as long as my network is this kind of size, then that's fine. And you would be right. However, unfortunately, our networks don't look like this. Instead, our networks look like this. And now you can see, well, if I try to use static routes in this sort of environment, it's going to get out of hand pretty quickly, and you would be right. It would get out of um, it would get out of hand um, very very quickly. So just think about it. Think about it like this. Let's say I wanted to configure this guy with static routes so that he can reach every single network. Well, guess what? This is its own network because these are layer three switches. These are point to point links. This is its own network. Then we've also got the VLANs down here as well. VLANs in this site, VLANs in this site, etc. And you can see what I'm saying. It just gets out of hand. It's just not feasible. Because again, we'll be spending so much time configuring these routes, we won't have time to do anything else. Now this is where dynamic routing protocols can help. What dynamic routing protocols do is that they allow these devices, and again, this, this is based on that every single router or every single layer three device needs to be configured with a dynamic routing protocol. So let's say that I configure a dynamic routing protocol on all of my devices. So all of my devices in this picture. But guess what? These devices will talk to each other. They'll work out, okay, these are the networks that I know about. These are the networks that I am connected to. They will exchange all this routing information. So now, every single device, every single layer three um, 
device, router, layer, um, so router, layer through switch, etc. They will know about every single network that exists in your enterprise. And then guess what? They will go ahead and calculate the fastest routes to every single network, others routes to the routing table. And what did we have to do? All we all we had to do, guys, all we had to do is enable the routing protocol on those devices. And that's our job done. That is the beauty of dynamic routing protocols. They do everything for us. They do all the heavy lifting for us. So now let's go back to this sort of example and see how dynamic routing protocols would help us in this in this sort of scenario. So now, instead of myself as the, the network engineer or yourself as the network engineer having to go into our board and saying it and saying to it, okay, to reach these two networks, you have to use um, R2 and R3 respectively. Instead, we go into every single one of these routers and we configure our dynamic routing protocol on those routers. And then they do everything else. They do all the heavy lifting. Now R1 will speak to R2. And R1 will be like, okay, R2, these are all the networks I know about. Okay? So, if there's any networks that you don't know about, but I know about, then you can reach those networks through me. R2 is like, okay, well, 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 wait a minute. You've just told me about this network over here, this network, and this network. And you're telling me that I can reach them through you? Well, guess what, buddy? I'm going to add those... I'm, going to add, I'm now going to add routes to my routing table, saying that to reach these networks, I have to go through you. And then RT does the same thing. RT tells R1, okay, I, I know how to reach this network, and you can reach him through me. R1 believes him, and then obviously R1 adds those routes to that network to his, to his routing table. So the way that dynamic routing protocols work, it just allows routers to speak with their neighbors, and the neighbors tell them all the information. The neighbors will tell them, okay, these are all the networks that exist in the enterprise. These are all the networks that I'm connected to. And because I'm because I'm telling you this, you can trust that you can reach those networks through me. R1 does the same thing. R1's like, okay, R2, um, you tell me about all the networks that you know about that you can reach. Let me tell you all the networks that I know about and that I can reach. And this is how this information is exchanged. So again, we have to do nothing apart from enable the routing protocol on our Cisco devices. And now going back to this sort of LAN topology. One of the benefits of dynamic routing protocols is that they allow your routers and, lay and um, layer three switches to react dynamically to changes in the network topology. So let's just say this guy up here, R1, has a connection to network X. And let's say that this guy down here, he's, he's R2. His current path to reach network X is through here. So that's the path that he uses to talk with devices on network X. Let's just imagine for a second that this link were to go down. Well, guess what? That's no problem. Before, we would have to, with static routes, go into our devices and manually reconfigure all of their routes to point towards this network. Well, guess what? This guy over here, let's just call him R3. R3 will notify all of his neighboring routers. Now look, this link is down, so you have to now factor that in when you try to calculate your best path to reach network X. This guy's like, well, thanks for telling me, R3, because eventually this notification that this link has gone down will go all the way down to R2. He's like, well, thank you for telling me. Thank you very much for telling me, R3. I will now use this path over here to reach a network X, and I can still communicate with devices in network X. That happens within a few seconds, and R2 does it all by itself without needing any intervention from us whatsoever. So now, just to outline the process that we've discussed in these two whiteboard examples, the onus is now on the routers and layer 3 switches to build the routing table. Basically, our routers speak to each other and exchange routing information. Every router will know about all networks within a couple of seconds, and then each router will work out their best route for every single network and then move those routes into the routing table. Routers can also react dynamically to failures in the primary route and select a secondary route. And we saw that with network X. So if, if your primary route fails, don't worry, that's no problem. I can react dynamically to that and then use another, another route. Now, it's important to understand that there are two different types of routing protocols which are designed to exchange routes in two different sort of scenarios. They are IGPs, which are interior gateway protocols like OSPF, EIGRP, and RIP. And then we have exterior gateway protocols like BGP. So what's the difference between IGPs and EGPs? So the technical point of view of this is that IGPs, they allow routers within the same autonomous system to exchange routes and build a routing table through dynamic routing protocols EGPs, like BGP, they allow routers in different autonomous systems to exchange routes and build their routing table. Okay, Abdul, what the hell does that mean? Well, let me just whiteboard this 
Let me just whiteboard um, this for you guys. So in this example, when we mention autonomous system, think of an, an autonomous system as this. All the routers, all the layer three devices under the control of a single entity. So as an example, let's say I start up company X. I've got all of my routers, all of my layer three devices in company X. Well, guess what? That's, a, that's known as a autonomous system because these are all devices under my control, under company X's control. In this case, I would use an IGP like OSPF, configure OSPF on these routers, and then they will now start to exchange routes, exchange routing information, and then we will build the routing table through a dynamic routing protocol. Now, imagine there's also another company called Company Y. This company, they want to merge with me. So in this, in this sense, we need to exchange routes because they need to be able to reach some networks in Company X, I also need to be able to reach some networks in company Y. So we need to exchange routes. So obviously within that enterprise, they're gonna use a IGP like OSPF, EIGP or RIP to build their routing tables and exchange routes, okay? However, when it comes to exchanging routes with me, they will use a EGP, a exterior get, an exterior gateway protocol. And this is known as exchanging routes between different, between different autonomous systems because essentially we have two different entities exchanging routes between each other so now i can exchange routes with company y company y can exchange routes with me by using a egp like bgp now why do we have interior gateway protocols and why do we have exterior gate exterior gateway protocols the reason being is because these protocols are designed to exchange routes and build routing tables in different situations so as an example igps they focus on speed so within our within our enterprise all we care about is can we is can we reach these networks the fastest way possible. However, when you start to exchange routes between different companies, you don't really care about how quickly you can reach that company. All you care about is hmm, can I have a stable route? Can I have a route which doesn't change very very often, so that I can still exchange information between X and Y? And that's what BGP provides us. Now, in the CCNA exam, we don't delve too much into BGP. And to be fair, the only IGP that we have a look at is OSPF. However, it's important to understand that there's a distinction between IGPs and EGPs. These are, these are the two different types of routing protocols that you will see throughout your career as a network engineer. Okay, guys, so we have reached the end of this video and we've discussed dynamic routing protocols in some pretty good depth. Just to recap, dynamic routing protocols allow our devices to all speak to each other allows our routers and layer through switches to speak to their neighbors, discover the best routes to every single network and puts those routes into the routing table. Really, we've looked at the two different types of routing protocols, IGPs and EGPs, and when we would use either one. If you found this video useful and would like to see more content like this, then please subscribe to my channel and thank you very much for watching.